the point is, guys, if we had a million pounds, we would spend it, right? It wouldn't be secret for long. People would see the impact it would have in our lives, right? And as pounds, how much more does salvation impact our lives? It changes us. David was a man that knew this, and he is, uh, I'm going to read his words as our call to worship today, where he says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds amongst the peoples, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works he has done, his miracles and his judgments he has uttered. The point is here, David's salvation, his trust in the Lord could be seen because it changed his life. He says, make known to the nations, it is such good news. He is so faithful and so loving. Let's sing a new song to him. So in churches, that's why we gather. We gather to remind ourselves of who God is, to glorify him, to remind ourselves of the wondrous work he's done in our lives and pray that others would come to know him and his salvation. Great. Let us pray together now. Uh, Dear Heavenly Father, gracious God, we come before you now, Lord, and just worship you. Lord, we worship you for you are our Redeemer, our Saviour, our great High Priest. Oh Lord, we thank you for the proclamation from the tomb. Why do you seek uh, the living amongst the dead? He is risen. Lord, help us have that assurance right now in our hearts that our Saviour lives. That he is seated at the right hand of God in heaven and interceding for us. The Lord, even right now, you hear your people's cries, your people's prayers. And Lord, you perfect them and you respond to us. Father, we, we need to have hope in that this day. For many of us have prayed numerous years for loved ones, for family members to come and to know you. And we just pray, Father, that in your right time you will answer our prayers and your grace and your love. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross for people like us, messy, broken, sinful people. And Lord, it was your joy to redeem us, to die for us, to rise and claim us as your people, as your children. Father, I just thank you so much for Dornoch Free Church. Lord, we pray that you strengthen this body of believers here. You encourage their hearts. That, Lord, if someone is here and has sat here multiple Sundays, but yet doesn't know you in their hearts, we pray, Lord, that today would be the day of new birth for them, that they would come to see Jesus. Father, we pray for the leadership here. Give them grace, wisdom, and discernment. We pray for Al, Lord, as he transitions into his new role here. We pray you just give him rest this week. And Lord, that you give him excitement and vision and a passion for your flock here in Dornoch. And Father, we do come before you now knowing that you are able to pick up all our burdens and they are light to you. So, Lord, we just come with you with the the burdens that weigh us down. The burdens as we look at our families, look at our friends, and we worry about them, Lord. We pray that we would trust you with their souls. Lord, we come with you with the burdens of our world as prices uh, increase, as fuel costs more, as we all feel the pinch on our wallets, Lord. We we trust that you are sovereign over this. And, Lord, we come before you. Uh, worried about the people of Ukraine and uh, the Lord, even the people of Russia right now in this horrible war. We pray, Lord, that one of your names is the Prince of Peace. So we pray, Lord, that many people would come to know Jesus and that that would bring peace, not the mechanics of man or the schemes of man. 
Uh, Lord, we just pray for the people who have been removed from their homeland and feel uprooted and lost. Lord, we thank you again. Another name for you is the rock, a shield, a fortress, a safe space. So we pray for many who are uh, removed from the UK right now, Lord, that they would come to know you as their safe space, their rock, their unmovable thing in their lives. We pray that many would be saved through um, the local church. So Father, I just as well want to thank you and praise you for Matt and Kaylee. Uh, Lord, we just pray for him as he's in his final year of study and he comes to open the word for us today. Encourage his heart as he preaches. Uh, Lord, help us have receptive hearts to hear your word, uh, to accept your challenge, to take your encouragement. But Lord, help us uh, just today know your power and your authority as your word is preached through your servant. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning to you all. and It's a privilege to be here in Doorknock this morning after traveling many miles from different parts of the world. It's great to see God's people gathered in another part of the world and know that his work continues wherever we are on this globe. Our reading this morning comes from Luke. The Gospel according to Luke chapter 4. So we'll read that together. Uh, Luke 4 verse 16 to 44. And we'll be focusing on a particular passage there. Verses 31 to 37. I'll point that out as we go through. But we'll read a a larger chapter for for context there. So we start at verse 16 of chapter 4. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom... He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marvelled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, Truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, And a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath, in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha. And none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. And these next verses are the passage we're focusing on this morning. And Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! Huh, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him. 
having done him no harm. And they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And reports about him went in, out into every place in the surrounding region. And he arose and left the synagogue and entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was ill with a high fever, and they appealed to him on her behalf. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she rose and began to serve them. Now when the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Have you ever known someone who just seems to have an air of authority? Maybe it was that one teacher in high school, and the first day that you came to class, you sat down and you saw her and you just knew not to cross her. She just had this sense of authority. Maybe it was the way she talked or, or the way she walked. There are just those in, in life who, who seem to project a sense of, of authority. And you can't help but admire them for this. And we read in our passage today that this is what the people of Capernaum thought about Jesus. They are amazed at Jesus' authority. And it's not just what Jesus says that they find amazing, is it? It's also that when Jesus speaks, amazing things happen. We see this in our passage today, don't we? Jesus shows his ultimate authority by speaking one short sentence. Jesus proves that he is Lord, that he is the, the Son of God, who is power even over demons. And so that's what we want to, to focus on this morning, that Jesus, the Holy One of God, has authority even over powers of darkness. And there's three things in this passage that we want to focus on. Firstly, that Jesus' authority is challenged. Secondly, that Jesus then demonstrates his authority. And finally, that Jesus' authority needs to be recognized. So Jesus has arrived, as we read in verse 31, he's arrived in Capernaum, which is a seaside town in the northwest of the Sea of Galilee. And he's come down from the mountains from his hometown of Nazareth. And he's come preaching, preaching the good news of the kingdom. And we see that Jesus is causing well, he's causing quite a stir here in the synagogue. We read in verse 32 that it's because Jesus is teaching there and he's teaching like no one else ever has. You know, the local people in Capernaum would have been used to people preaching to them in the synagogue on the Sabbath, Pharisees and scribes. But these uh, Pharisees and scribes, they would... They wouldn't spend time in, in the Old Testament itself. They would rather focus on, on the traditions and the legalistic interpretations of the Old Testament that had been laid down by scribes before them. So these usual preachers would, would teach in a really indirect and impersonal way. And politicians do this all the time too, don't they? They never give a straight answer. They talk in a roundabout way, appealing to statistics or to what someone else said or didn't say. They never seem to get at the heart of the matter. And the Pharisees and scribes who usually taught in Capernaum, they're, they're the same. They never get at the heart of what the Old Testament is all about. But Jesus is different. Jesus teaches like no one else does. He explains the word of God with authority. 
Well, this makes so much sense, doesn't it, when we think about it, really? Because Jesus really does have all authority. Now, this authority over the Word has been given him by God the Father. The Old Testament is all about God. And who knows God better? Who knows who the Father truly is but the Son, but Jesus? The Lord Jesus says this himself in Luke chapter 10, verse 22. He says, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So is there any wonder then that Jesus' teaching has authority? He is the ultimate authority, the ultimate go-to if you want to know about God. That's because he himself is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So these people sitting there on the stone benches of Capernaum Synagogue, they have their eyes glued on Jesus. They've never heard words like, the ones he's speaking before, words of comfort and hope and salvation, but also words of repentance, a call to repentance and faith. But now, in the middle of this important teaching moment of Jesus, his authority is suddenly challenged. A demon-possessed man shouts out, interrupting the service, Stopping the teaching of Jesus, we read that verse 34. Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Wouldn't this have been quite a shock to all those people listening in Capernaum? I mean, we can kind of imagine that, can't we? It'd be like in a regular Sunday service, someone suddenly stepping up during the, the preaching and saying to the, the preacher, hey, why are, you, why are you going on like that? Just, just take a seat. That's quite unnerving to think about. I mean, you think, what's going on here? Well, this, this demon through the man that he's possessing, he's working to undermine Jesus' authority. And we see that in verse 34. Go away, Jesus. Why are you bothering us? Have you come to destroy us? The demon is anxious. He's worried about Jesus' teaching. And no wonder. For this demon knows who Jesus really is. He knows that Jesus has not only the authority, but but also the power to destroy him and his master. For the demon calls, calls Jesus something, doesn't he? He calls Jesus the Holy One, of God. And this is an important title. That's one we need to pay a little bit of attention to because it's used elsewhere. It's used in the Old Testament for men who had been set apart, who'd been chosen by God for a special task. People like Elisha the prophet and Aaron the high priest. But now this title is applied to Jesus. And it's applied to him because he is the Messiah. He's chosen and and set apart by God to save God's people. We read verse 18 of chapter 4, and there Jesus says, I have been anointed by the Spirit of the Lord to proclaim freedom, to proclaim liberty to those who are oppressed, those who are blind. Even more importantly, this title, the Holy One of God, it reminds us that Jesus is the Son of God. Holy and blameless together with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And no one else but Jesus can rightly claim to be the Holy One of God. And it's this knowledge, this knowledge of who Jesus is, that worries the demon This is why he doesn't want Jesus to continue teaching and and preaching. The demon and his boss, Satan, they're quite happy with the people of Capernaum being blind, not knowing that the Savior is there, the Messiah, before them. They don't want them to know who Jesus is. 
We don't read much about demon possession in the Old Testament. Actually, we don't read it about it much in the New Testament either. It's really only in the Gospels that we, we read about demons. And why is that? Well, it's because the Gospels record for us a pivotal, a central moment in history, don't they? They record for us the time when, when Jesus, the Savior, has come to earth to do away with sin, to defeat Satan and his forces. And so now while Jesus is on earth, it's as if the curtains are pulled back, isn't it? And, and we get a glimpse at the great war, the great battle between light and darkness, between Satan and his followers and, and God and his redemptive work. Because they're all about trying to defeat God, to prevent the salvation of God's people. Isn't this what, what Satan and his demons are all about? Stopping, and challenging, and, and slowing down the work of Christ. This goes way back, doesn't it, to Genesis 3, to, to the fall and to sin. There God said that enmity, strife would be put between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, between Satan and, and Christ and his church. And ever since that time, Satan and his followers have, have been trying their utmost to defeat God's good work. And we see this around us, don't we? You know, as 21st century Westerners, we don't talk much about demons or spiritual forces you know, so many people think that's all medieval superstition. There's no place for that anymore. But what a mistake that thinking is. For we know that Satan and his demonic forces are real. And we can see their work still today. And we see repeated attacks against the authority of God. You know, the church is, is being attacked. It's being Silence, or trying to be silenced, and the gospel cut out of society. You know, even here in Scotland, there are, are bills before Parliament that, that seek to make it an offence to speak of God's will, of what it means to be a male and female, and the sanctity of life. But Satan and his demons, they don't only work at the level of state and society, and perhaps this is more frightening, isn't it? They also challenge and, and attack God's work in, in our personal lives as well. And maybe you've experienced this yourself. So often Satan whispers doubts and accusations in our hearts. Oh, you can't really be saved. Your sins are too great. You remember that sin you did back when, when you were younger that, that no one else knows about? Well, I know about it. How can you think you're forgiven? Or he and his forces try to tempt us away from Christ to going back under Satan's dark authority. Oh, you know, clicking on that website's not that bad. Drinking that much will make you happier. Eh? Posting that, that comment about so-and-so, oh, that'll make you feel better about yourself. And all of this, Satan and and his followers are trying to undermine Christ's authority as king of our lives. Christ's authority is king of our, of our hearts. As the one to, we, to whom we owe allegiance. And you know, in the face of such powerful challenges, we would certainly give up. If it was left up to us, we would we'd go back to sin. But we have someone on our side who is so much more powerful than sin or the forces of darkness. And that's the second thing that we want to focus on in this passage, that Jesus demonstrates his authority over all things, but particularly the forces of darkness. And how does he do this? Well, he does this, of course, by casting out the demon. In verse 35, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent. And come out of him. Oh, we might ask, well, why does Jesus, why does Jesus rebuke the demon? 
Well, because the demon has no right to have possessed this man. The demon has no right to be undoing God's good work. He has no right to be challenging Christ. And so the Lord Jesus orders the demon's mouth to be shut and for him to be gone from the man. And and Jesus' words here are direct commands. They're filled with divine authority and divine power. And what happens to the demon? Well, the demon has to obey. There is no other option. The unclean demon cannot ignore a command from the Holy One of God. As we see here that Jesus demonstrates that he is the one who practices what he preaches. You know, not only does he speak with authority, but his authority is displayed in in this miracle. He shows who he really is, the, the authoritative, the powerful son of God. Jesus is so much stronger, infinitely more powerful than even the devil himself. For that is who's behind this attack, isn't it? It's the devil. It's Satan. But Jesus shows himself that much more powerful. And if we had any doubt of this, Luke adds this. I wonder if you picked it up, this real tiny detail in verse 35. After throwing the man in the midst of the synagogue and, and coming out of him, Luke says that the demon comes out having done the man no harm. Doesn't that prove Jesus' ultimate authority? The demon cannot even offer a parting shot, as it were. He he cannot even harm this man out of spite. And I'm sure he, he would have if he could have. But he can't. Jesus commands him and his command is instantly and fully obeyed. So complete is his authority. And what about this poor man? We haven't really focused on him much. But can any of us even begin to imagine what it must have been like for this man who was possessed by this demon? He's been oppressed and tormented, perhaps for many years, unable to think, unable to act, unable even to live for himself. And perhaps some of you here have had a partial anesthesia before where you can't move some of your limbs for a period of time and that's a very unnerving feeling but imagine not being able to control not only your body but even your mind that's a terrifying terrifying thought and yet here we see the mercy and the love of Jesus so clearly don't we His words of rebuke to the demon, their words of freedom and of life to this poor man. This man's life is his own again. What a miracle. But what's the significance of all this? Is it just that we see how powerful Jesus is? Well, that's part of it. But what happens here in Capernaum, it's pointing forward. It's a It's a foreshadowing of of something that's to come. It's pointing forward to what would happen on one dark Friday on a cross on the hill of Golgotha. It pointed forward to a day when, when Satan and his demons, they must have thought they'd finally got the upper hand. But boy, were they wrong. For on that cross, Jesus Christ defeated sin the devil and his forces once and for all. And his victory was proven in the resurrection from the dead in the empty tomb. Now Paul tells us this in Colossians 2 verse 15, that God through Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to shame by triumphing over them. Christ proved his authority, his power, over all things on the cross and in his resurrection. And it's the cross that is the ultimate display of, of victory over the forces of darkness. And that's what we should be thinking of 
here in Luke 4. The demons and, and devils are no match for Christ. And when we think about that, what a comfort that is, isn't it? For us this morning. Those of us who believe in, in Jesus, like this man in our passage, we've been set free from captivity to Satan and the powers of darkness. They no longer rule us, Jesus does. We follow Jesus and, and him alone. In Jesus, God has, as, as Paul says in Colossians 1, delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us, brought us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And isn't that incredible? And because we belong to the light, because of what Jesus has done for us, Satan no longer has power over us. And what does this mean practically for you this morning? What does it mean in those moments when Satan accuses you, and he does, when he reminds you of your sinful past, Martin Luther once wrote, wrote this in a letter, and, and they're beautiful words. He says, When I awoke last night, the devil came and wanted to debate with me, arguing that I was a sinner. To this I replied, Tell me something new, devil. I already knew that perfectly well. I have committed many a solid and, and real sin. But now the sins I have committed are no longer mine, but they belong to Christ. And aren't those words so true? Our sins no longer belong to us. They've been taken by Christ in our place. That we may no longer bear punishment, that we may no longer face guilt, that we no longer have shame. You know, the accusations of Satan and his demons are empty. This is a precious truth that we can remind ourselves and each other of. And the same is true for when Satan and his forces tempt us. Are you powerless in the face of, of such a foe? Sometimes we think we are. But then we forget, we forget who our Lord is. That we serve one who has authority and power over all things. And you know, God has not left us alone here on earth in this, this, this fight. But he's given us his spirit, the spirit of, of his son. And what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, part of his work is, is to strengthen our resolve in the fight. And remind us of our commitment to Jesus, our love for him, our desire to follow him. The spirit works in us the ability to choose what is, what is right and not what is what is evil? And the Spirit gives us the ability to order Satan and his demons away from us, from tempting us. Plus the Holy Spirit, well, what does he use but the authoritative word of God, the Bible? We've got no greater weapon than this in our fight against sin and darkness. So let's use the word of God in our spiritual fight and make prayer and, and Bible reading a priority in our lives. And what we see of Jesus in this passage also gives us comfort when we see the devil and his followers at work in this world. Even in dark times, when we feel like things are encroaching in on the church, for we know that Christ has triumphed. That he will preserve his church and his people even in the darkest day. No devil or demon will succeed in, in preventing the coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus demonstrates his authority and power and we need to recognize this. That's the, that's the third and, and last thing that we want to look at briefly. 
you know, this clear display of Christ's authority, even over the spiritual realm, it ought to lead people to recognize Jesus for who he is. And in a way, we see that happening in our text. For what is the reaction of the people in, in Capernaum? Or well, verse 36, they were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. You know, the people are astounded, astonished at what has happened, at the demonstration of Jesus' authority here. But sadly, while the people recognize that Jesus is powerful, that he has authority, they do not seem to recognize where his authority comes from, do they? The people of Capernaum do not fall down in worship before the Messiah. They don't recognize Jesus fully for who he is. They see his authority and power, but they don't seem to recognize that this shows that Jesus is the Son of God. So the question this morning then is, do you? Do you recognize who Jesus is? Do you truly recognize the authority and the power of the one whom you serve? Do you see what Jesus has done for you in delivering you from Satan's clutches? Did you feel amazement when you heard what Jesus did in this passage? You know, sometimes I think we become so familiar with the gospel stories that they fail to wow us, to amaze us like, like they should. Because what isn't what Jesus did here incredible? He frees a man from oppression. He shows himself supreme even over the forces of darkness. But even more amazing, our passage reminds us that Jesus has freed you from the oppression of sin and the oppression of Satan. Our Lord Jesus is truly the authoritative and the powerful Son of God. And if this is true, and I, and I hope it is for you this morning, I hope that you recognize that Jesus is the Son of God, then doesn't this demand a response from us? If Jesus has all authority and power, doesn't that require something of you? Realizing this, recognizing what, what God has done for us, what God has done for you, it means submitting to the authority of Jesus in your life. It means recognizing his authority over all the things that you do, over all the choices that you make, over the way you live your life. Who is it that is king of your heart? Jesus demands that place by the fact that he is the son of God and our saviour and he's bought us for himself and if we truly recognise Jesus' authority and power then surely this means that we want to share what we know about him with others doesn't it and we read in verse 37 that reports about Jesus went throughout all the region did you hear what happened the other Sabbath in Capernaum, people were talking about what happened in that synagogue. And no wonder, it was pretty amazing. And if these people in Capernaum were motivated to talk about Jesus, when they didn't even fully recognize him for who he is, well, how much more should we be talking about Jesus when we know what he's done for us, when we know what he did on that cross and in the empty tomb? Jesus is the Holy One of God. He has triumphed over sin and the forces of darkness. He has all authority and power. 
And so may we submit to him in love and worship and may we be ready to speak of the amazing and wonderful things that God has done for us. Let's pray. Our merciful God and Father, we just come before you and thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Son, for his love that he has shown to sinners like us, that we are freed from our sin and from the oppression of darkness through him. Lord, none of us truly understand what what our Saviour went through on that cross. But we thank you for your saving work. And we just pray, Lord, that this will change our lives. That we will worship you in love. That we will desire to serve you. That we will speak of your great deeds. Father, we thank you that you have triumphed over darkness. And may this be a comfort to us. And may it assure us to go forward in our lives. Even when we see things changing so rapidly in society around us where your name is no longer appreciated but despised. Lord, may we have the name of Jesus on our lips always. Change our hearts, Lord. Forgive us our sin and fill us with your spirit that we may love and serve you always. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us hear together the blessing of our God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.